So I went down into the- uh, Your bat cave. <laughs> my bat cave, I actually have a bat cave. And when I went in there, I found like, oh my God, I have original storyboards, original scripts and all that. I thought, well, I'll have to give them to posterity somehow because they're- <laughs> Yes. <laughs> some of them were the original take of stuff that got that chain. You know, you could see where it was the first take on the storyboard. You got stuff that evolved into the final episode. These things sort of get lost to history. I went through, I found the original spec scripts that I used to get on Batman. Those are the scripts that got me on the show that they gave mm -hmm. to Alan Burnett who ran the show. I thought, oh, these are pretty good scripts and they'll never see the light of day. <laughs> Well, you know, if you uh -huh. want it to, you know, go to posterity. <laughs> we are right. posterity. Yeah. Showtime, everybody. Uh-huh. Engagement. They can talk all they like. That means everything. Don't forget that. You heard it, folks. Welcome, everybody, to another Watch Tower Database exclusive interview. Our very special guest today is Randy Rogel. Is that the emphasis? Randy, yes. Randy okay. Rogel. I should have said yes. Rogel. That sounds wrong, right? But... <laughs> Rich Fogel. Randy at least Rogel. He, yeah, at least yeah. he didn't say Rogel. <laughs> A writer from Batman the Animated Series, co writer of the Sub Zero movie, and perhaps most dear to our hearts, the writer for the Zeta Project Season 2 episode Lost and Found. The fact that you wrote a Zeta episode, we had to get something in there. For All right. It. For DC, you've mostly been involved. Of Batman, how much of a fan of him were you before working on the cartoon? As a little kid, I remember I, I would read some comic books and I always thought Batman was pretty cool. When I came to Hollywood, I was writing spec scripts for live action television shows. And a friend of mine, Kelly Ward, he did Grease with John Travolta, he's one of the leads in that, the mm -hmm. big red one. So he was working over at Universal. He'd been at Hanna-Barbera before. I think they're developing this Batman show over at Warner Brothers. I thought, oh, Batman, I remember Batman. He goes, well, it's an animated show. I said, I don't know anything about animation. They're, they're trying to do it like a live act. They're trying to do it real. Now, did you say, have you interviewed Alan Burnett? Yes, he was actually the first person we ever interviewed. Well, for Alan, yeah. Alan is the guy. Alan was the showrunner. And I had been auditioned to get on the show. I've been writing spec scripts and all that. So producer goes, yeah, hey, you know, the, the showrunner read your script and he likes it. He wants to meet you. So I went in to meet with Alan, but he already had a staff in place. You know, he said, I can't hire you, but I just wanted to know who you were. And I thought, well, good. I want you to know I am. But then I wrote another one. The first one I, I wrote was called The Ape, if you want. I'll give it. It's called the Ape Man, which is pretty good. And so that's when he he says, you know what? I'm going to bring you on board. He said, I've written the outline to Two Face. Why don't you write the script from my outline? I thought. Yes, of course, you know, that was a great outline. I followed it very closely. It went into production and it was doing really well. People were loving it. And so I went back to him, you know, because I still wasn't on staff. And I said, hey, you know, because it was Two-Face, it was a two-parter. We ended it. Right. Do <laughs> you have an idea for the second part? He goes, no, actually, I've been thinking about that. I said, well, I have an idea. So I told him, he goes, I really hate that. <laughs> well, what about this then? How about, how about this idea? And I gave him another one. He goes, well, now that one I like. And he said, I tell you what, I'm going to bring you on staff. And that's how I, and then Alan kind of trained me as a writer. <laughs> I owe him big time. In Batman, you have these fantastic rogues gallery, but each one is anchored in reality. Superman can fly. You can have all these aliens and all these, you know, magical powers. The crook would look at Superman and he would go, blam, blam. He shoot. Superman would stand like this as the bullets <laughs> bounced off the chest. And then the guy would run out of bullets and he would throw the gun and Superman would duck. We always wondered, <laughs> why did he have to duck? Yeah. One of the things that makes Batman probably the, the most interesting of those characters is you can kill him. So even the fantastic characters that we have, there was always an explanation for them in the natural world, like like Clayface. We didn't have vampires. We didn't have ghosts. We you know we didn't have supernatural. It all was rooted in the real world. He could go up against really formidable opponents who could really hurt him. Who really defines your hero is your villain. Your protagonist is going to want something. You're going to throw obstacles in the way and how your protagonist deals with those obstacles defines who that character is. So if you have a really formidable villain, protagonist really has to rise to the occasion. And with Batman, you know, he has to be the biggest and baddest and most clever and all that. But with Superman, if you don't have kryptonite, you're dead. But eventually you did get into that kind of stuff with your Tiger Tiger episode. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and even Tiger Tiger, I think, was rooted in something real. Like Ra's al Ghul has a certain mm. magical component to him. Right. And all it does just makes it a different series. That's all. Just, I mean, it expands the power. And, you know, the longer the series goes, you know, yeah. your power, you, you need to be able to expand your Find more things, you know, yeah. yeah. The Batman world, like, always lends itself to sort of pull from so many different parts 
parts of pop culture like you could have this sort of monster story or like an indiana jones story like with rachel ghoul or a james bond type story or exactly. whatever i personally love the tiger tiger episode just for the william blake reference it's one of my favorites and like the the haunting uh quote from batman at the end of the episode so i'm just wondering if that poem in itself inspired the episode or how did those different elements yeah. create michael reeves was one of the story editors so i think he had a fondness for blake the island of dr moreau probably was his biggest influence but michael's very well read so it's not right. on him to be able to quote blake i'm a literature person too so oh, I, right. I wanted to go into it looking at looking at that when i was growing up i had some of those um vhs uh, collections of episodes from the batman series i specifically had the robin one which was just the two robin reckoning part episodes so that tape got worn out <laughs> so yeah. that's definitely one of my favorite episodes of the show and it won an emmy which is like I can totally see why. Oh, oh he's going to go <laughs> yes. get the Emmy. I've got, I've nice. got several of these, but this is the one I keep up here on my... Uh... Can you send us the Emmy as well? <laughs> yeah, can you send it to the For posterity, yeah. <laughs> For posterity, yeah. That was actually pretty cool, too, because that was a prime time Emmy. So we were up against the big guys, and we won, and that right. was... Right. Does Robin's Reckoning stick with you as, like, a favorite episode, or is it just kind of a trophy for you? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, they're all... You work so hard on all of them, so Robin's right. Reckoning is very close to my heart but because i get to the origin of two-face the origin yeah. of yeah. that you know all that and how that all came to be so yeah i love that episode but there's others i love too a along with robin's reckoning you also were were part of one of the only other times that we saw batman's early days with the mechanic being that you're attached to two out of the three times that we get flashbacks to the earliest days of batman's career what drew you to you know that time period and did you have any any other ideas to like throw in in the time between that just didn't end up making it to screen you know you're sitting there discussing ideas and what makes a good story and if that makes a good story then everything else follows from that if it takes you back in time i remember sitting with alan at lunch one time and he says like hey you know what when the batmobile because we're always destroying the batmobile always because who the hell fixes that <laughs> but he's got out some kind of mechanic but then that mechanic would know he's working on the batmobile penguin was able to get and he was able to control that batmobile right. exactly that was the whole idea behind them. Which is a very similar thing to Batman Returns. <laughs> he also does Yes, <laughs> and we wrote it first. Yeah, yes. I, <laughs> it first. And I remember when we saw the movie we went, wait a minute. I guess great minds think alike, right? <laughs> right. Like, That's right. You know, the way they finance these things is they would get licensing from the network, Warner Brothers would put up a third, and then Kenner would, you know, the toy company put up a third. They each owned a third of the show because these things are very expensive to produce. Kenner would, would like say, hey, you know, we just came up with this new bat glider. Can you work at it? Can you, can you work at into the mm -hmm. uh, toy into your <laughs> we used to go no we can't do that if one comes up that we need well then we'll use it but we're not going to make this a toy commercial nowadays they probably would have the you know the, uh -huh. the, the juice <laughs> but in our days that we, we could say no there'd be something kind of fun to see like a closet full of like arctic bat suits <laughs> yeah. and fire or whatever <laughs> we should have done like a campy episode where everything was it was a, you know right. oh hey, this is my new bat mug i just got you know <laughs> yeah. have two more episodes that you did work on um were yeah. riddler's reform and make them laugh and make them laugh they really we used audio of the Riddler's toy commercial from Riddler's Reform. The story seems to imply that that's a live broadcasted commercial. So we've had a theory that these two episodes kind of take place at the same time. Was there any intent for that? That's really an interesting idea, man. I'm sure it cut costs a little bit. It was just an idea that presented itself. The idea of having two things going on simultaneously usually happens within the same episode because you're watching. See, if you watch one episode, then you move on, especially if they're not serial you may not put it together that that was happening at the same time. I became known for doing, um, I did Sing in the Rain, like 26 productions over many years, and I did the Donald O'Connor role. Famous number, Make Him Laugh. In fact, it's on YouTube, I think you can go see it. So Paul <laughs> Dini saw that. In fact, he came and saw me in the show. Let's do one called Make Him Laugh. With you being as involved as you were in the Make Him Laugh episode, you know, influencing it essentially, can we blame you for the Condiment King? No. That, <laughs> no? Oh, I was in Alan's office, and he came in like with this, he goes, I am the Condiment 
even people. <laughs> and Alan was just going, he was laughing, but it was like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah, even Batman's, it's going to be one of those nights. Or it's going to be one of those nights. It's like, uh-huh. what is, what, all the crazy people are out now, what is going on? This was another episode, Patient the Crime Doctor, that you wrote, Randy. Yeah. And it's uh, more grounded, uh, realistic, deals with family angst and uh, mob drama. We're wondering if you had a more affinity for writing these uh, more gritty episodes over like the more um, over the top stuff like the Joker. Yeah, I do. No, I do like more the, the more realistic. I like the more gritty, the more human, the more I can get to Batman or to Bruce Wayne, or the more I can you know, tug at your heartstrings. And I think it also just, it raises the stakes. I mean, you know where you can really see that play out? That would be Sub-Zero. The, sort of the heart and the emotion in that, as opposed to just rock him, sock him, shoot him up. There's an interesting thing about Freeze that he shares with Harvey Dent. There's the only two villains that I can think of off the top of my head that are not who they are because of greed or some evil intent. It's, mm-hmm. they were actually good people who were thrust into the position, but external events. Boyd Kirkland, who was just a terrific guy, one of the hardest working guys I've ever seen. He had directed so many episodes, he directed a lot of mine. And he came to me and he said, hey, one of the things I've asked for in my deal is that I get to direct a movie. And so they said, okay, we'll give you a Batman movie. I want to do Bane. I said, you know what? He makes me think of the Terminator. And so why don't we make Bane basically the Terminator and you can't kill this guy. Throughout the story, he keeps engaging Bane and every time he keeps getting more and more wounded, more and more injured. And at the same time, I had this kind of alternate story going where Bruce was in love with a woman and it's not going to work out with if he can't tell her he's Batman and all that. And so it was just a terrific story and it worked great. We had all worked out. We got a call from Warner Home Video. Oh man, you cannot believe this. The next Batman movie, we got Arnold Schwarzenegger. They're going to make him Mr. Freeze. So that's who we want, you know, the villain to be now. They said, oh no, no, we've already worked it out. We've already done it and it's Bane. And one of the execs said, well, can't you just use your word processor wherever it's says Bane put freeze. <laughs> there we go. It doesn't work He's like already that. the Terminator. There you go, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Different villains. I, I said, look, just forget it. We'll write a new script. And that's why I began to take a look at Freeze. And Paul's first take on Freeze was just terrific. Heart of Ice. This is the only villain I know that's motivated by love. We had a sequel to Sub-Zero where we went to the Bane story. The idea then for the the kind of the B story would be Robin and Batgirl meet each other as Robin and Batgirl and don't get along. And you know who did that later on? The Incredibles. Uh, Remember? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They did. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the girl and she interrupts, she goes, she goes, hey, I had him already, excuse me. Yeah. I, no, no, you didn't, I had him. Uh-huh. And they get in an argument, except you don't realize they're married. Okay, at ours, they really get pissed and he goes, you know, I had, I had, no, you didn't. I, they, they don't like each other. He called her, he says, you're nothing but a rank amateur. But then <laughs> in real life is Barbara and Dick, they're dating. Bruce says to Dick, if you're getting that serious with her and you're thinking about marriage, you need to tell her. What, you're gonna go out at night, you might get yourself killed and she's your wife, may have a kid, you know, you, 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 you know, you gotta be truthful with her. And so Dick is thinking about it and he goes, yeah. So he brings Barbara over to the Wayne Manor. He says, I want to show you something. She's all excited. They're gonna get, he's got the ring and all that. And he moves the bookcase and the stairway. And she's like, what the hell? Takes her down the steps. And when they get all the way down there, she's seeing the Batmobile and she's seeing the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the costumes and the, and he turns around and he looks at her kind of like, <laughs> I'm Robin. She hauls off and slugs him in the mouth. Oh, God. She goes, ow! Oh. She goes, what do you mean I'm a rank amateur? What about rank amateur? And then he goes, wait a minute. And, now, and then she goes, oh, wait a minute. And, and so yeah. now he realizes who they are. And they realized, and, and so of course their lives get each other way. That never came to, you know, we just didn't get the chance to do that movie, but that's what would have followed Sub-Zero. We also interviewed the composers. Michael McQuistian did, did the score for Sub-Zero. Right. I thought Michael did a terrific job. You know, in fact, yeah. Michael would come in and say, okay, here's some themes I've come up with. And I remember the first one he played, I just said, Michael, I have no notes. That's perfect. <laughs> that's very rare. I just say, just do that. He hit that one out of the park, I thought. It was eligible for what they call an and which is like the Emmy of the Animation Award, and Sub Zero did win. We, we were up against Beauty and the Beast, I remember, and it, it won for it won oh, wow. for best you know movie, I guess, in video. I will ask while we're talking about it. Uh, you know, you, we already brought up you were in the Singing in the Rain uh, yeah. for several years, and you're the composer for a lot of the more famous Animaniac songs, like the you know pointing out all the countries, the Yakko's World stuff. Do you enjoy performing or writing for other performers more? I mean, I grew up doing lots of performing, but I think because 
because of that, I was exposed to great scripts and great writing and great music and all that. Mm -hmm. When you're performing, it's very physical, especially that role. Those kinds of roles I do are very physical. And he's flipping off the wall and all that. And when you're writing, it's very cerebral. Two different sides of your body. Rob Paulson and I do a uh, concert series. I mean, we've been in Seattle, we've been in Portland, um, we've been in New York three times. I mean, we've been all everywhere. The fans come out, because Rob is, you know, I mean, he's so many different characters. We have Maurice LaMarche, who's, you know, Futurama and Tress, you know, The Simpsons. We have a real Billy West. You know, once I was started running a show, a television show, and you just don't have time to, to be performing at all. But since this concert series has started, we've been doing it for three or four years now. We have a website called AnimaniacsLive.com or Animaniacs in Concert, too. And that gives a list of where we're going to be. And so it's really fun to be up on stage again and doing and doing the music I write. You know, they're different, but I enjoy them both. And I'm writing more right now, you know, for the new season. They, they're Animaniacs back in production with Spielberg producing. I'm writing two songs for it right now. Zeta That's Project, really, when? Awesome. When are we? <laughs> the people, you know, the animators that you're working with are just the top artists. I became very close with my storyboard artists and the, the character design. Guys like Dan Reba. You never want to piss off an animator because they'll they'll draw you with a big hippo butt. You know, when you, uh, <laughs> just the level of talent that you're dealing with of people is pretty impressive. Just to make sure that we do get it in, I do want to talk about the Zeta project briefly if you, oh, if sure, you feel sure. up to it. <laughs> okay. I know I know it's like the most forgotten, you know, show. It's among... everyone's favorite. Yeah. <laughs> well, episode you wrote is Lost and Found is the title of it. And it's an yeah. uh, episode where we finally actually see what Zeta was up to when he decided, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to work for the government because, you know, he sees this man's family, feels humanity for everybody. How did you become involved with the Zeta project for First of all, I suppose is a good okay, way to start. Okay, here's the answer to that. Bob Goodman, I ran into Bob, he was Alan Burnett's basically personal assistant and a really smart guy. You could tell just when you talk to Bob, you were really smart and he wanted to make it as a writer too. Alan kind of cultivated him along and I read one of Bob's scripts. It was really good. He'd written the spec movie script. So whenever I come down, we would talk and talk and talk. I moved on to Animania and Bob moved up into Batman Beyond and he became a regular writer on that. Created Zeta character when he was writing for Batman Beyond. It was a, a well-received character. Bob had called me. I was busy working on it. He goes, hey, why don't you do a Zeta project? for me and I go okay what and he's basically it's the fugitive this you know this robot's on the run yeah. the government trying with to no guns no guns well you can't you know, so I did that one but I was very busy with other shows so right. I just did the one it's interesting that the budget on it was as okay. low as it was compared to you know yes. Batman Beyond Bruce Tim has mentioned when they pitched Justice League they made a whole animated thing to show to Warner Brothers and they were like oh we don't need to see that just do it we trust you versus <laughs> I'm sure Zeta Project has just had like 60 pitches or something. Oh, Leslie, you're absolutely right. I want to see the Zeta Project sizzle reel. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> that may be buried in a vault somewhere. Yeah. Bob, yeah, he had a whole arc. Zeta does meet his master and find out mm -hmm. who he is and what it was meant for him and all that. But that was an arc over several seasons. Right. But I think what he, what he was going to find out about himself was a big surprise that, you know, the audience would not expect. Mm -hmm. I bet he was Bruce Wayne's biological son. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a second, Ted. One of our last questions, while we were going through and trying to build up a question list for you, we went through your IMDb, and I learned you worked on the 90s Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. I haven't watched it at all since, you know, childhood, but I've always been a huge Sonic fan, so I felt mm. like having you here, we needed to ask <laughs> something about it. Here's what I remember most about that. Warner Brothers brought me on to do Batman, but they called called me, they wanted me to write an episode of Sonic the Hedgehog. I went to Alan and I said, under my deal, can I write this episode? Because I need the money. You know, I wanted the money for it. And he said, yeah, go ahead. Just do it. Just don't <laughs> talk to Warner Brothers. Just do it. I didn't want to mess around because I really wanted to work at Warner Brothers. So I came in and uh, in a weekend, I mean, from morning to night, it's not the way I usually like to write. I wrote that like in a straight 48 hour period. And, you know, like I get, get it all. Like, so I hurried to make sure I got that done in time for the, when I was working on Batman, starting on Batman, it wouldn't conflict. And that's why I didn't write any more Sonic the Hedgehogs because now I was officially on staff. So what you're saying is in the spirit of Sonic the Hedgehog, you knew that you had <laughs> you to go fast. Go fast. I, yeah. <laughs> what would you say was your uh, your favorite moment from any of the Batman uh, episodes that you worked on? And do you have a favorite episode that you didn't write? Oh, there's a lot of those. I remember I did not work on Mask of the Phantasm because that was 
Madeline and Paul, you know, the three story editors. But meanwhile, while they were doing that, I was doing all the television episodes. I'm really pretty proud of the Batman show because, you know, again, it was a kid's show and we had to fight BSP all the time because of things we wanted to do. We wanted to do things that were really intelligent. And a lot of times you'll find it in the kids' market, like for example, the songs for Animaniacs. I had one exec say, you know, these songs are too hip for the room. You should be writing like Barney. And I told him, I said, no, no. I said, man, kids are a lot smarter than you think they are. So with Batman, I thought we really wrote up. And 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 that's mm -hmm. why that show, you know what our demo was for that? Usually it's like seven and nine or we had teenage, we, we had Howard Stern. But he used to watch Batman the Animation Series all the time. <laughs> he commented, we had an adult audience. We didn't lose the kid audience. Yeah. We just included sort of the smarter, well-read, more, you know, I think to the credit of the show and to the credit of Alan's leading it and Bruce Tim's artwork, all our storyboard artists, stuff, but certainly the writing, we did appeal to an older crowd. They didn't feel it was dumbed down too much. And I think that's one of the reasons the show has staying power. Yeah, it's a very mature cartoon. Yeah, for sure. My parents would sit with me occasionally and be like, oh, this is actually good. Why why have I not been keeping up with this with him? Yeah. And then all of a sudden the terrible trio happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll let you go, Randy, but we have yeah, really, yeah, really do work, appreciate guys, but you. What a yeah. joy it's been to talk with you. Same for you. Uh, anything that you're willing to send us, we'll definitely take from you. All behind the scenes stuff. I might send you my, you know, like the two, those first two scripts. But yeah, the script We didn't scripts, get it produced yeah. because you will find that in my spec script called the ape man the opening of that became the opening of sub-zero okay oh. yeah we appreciate you randy <laughs> yeah. my pleasure and thanks for fighting the good fight for <laughs> yes <laughs>